So you got to get it straightened out. <laughs> so the mob is not going to be Cliff done. Don't die. Cliff died. Came to us via Anita. Anita plays bridge, as you all might have heard, and she knew Cliff and Anita said, Get him, and I got him, and here he is, and here we all are. Cliff works or er, teaches at Lemoyne, and he is a dean at the. At, no? I'm a dean. Professor. Yeah. Don't, don't offend me. Don't insult me. <laughs> a dean's major job is to raise money. A dean's ma major job is to keep people like me in line, which is impossible. <laughs> Bob. He's at the Department of Anthropology, Criminology, and Sociology, which kind of it's, interrelates with each other. And he is an industrial and labor relations expert, or as we say in certain parts of the world, maven. And he is uh, got a PhD in economics from MIT, which is not a bad little school within itself. <laughs> so he's here to talk to us and tell us about criminology and the real numbers. So give him a warm hand or just a little slap on the back and bring him up. Thank you, Lewis. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I've been at Lemoyne now for 33 years. I might be settling in. Um, and most of that time I spent teaching about industrial relations and labor unions. But that program doesn't exist anymore. And about six or seven years ago, I moved to the Department of Anthropology, Criminology, and Sociology and tried to figure out what they needed me to do. And what they really needed me to do was teach in the criminology program. Um, we have a course, I started off with one course, I now teach several in that, but the one course I teach, CJS 101, the students call Introduction to Criminology, what we call Mythbusters. Or if you like, why you think you know so much about crime and crim criminal justice and why almost everything you know is wrong, <laughs> is the theme of the course. So I spend a whole semester doing that. I'm spending a whole semester doing that now. You are going to get the one-hour version of the entire class. Okay. Why do we misunderstand crime and the criminal justice system so much? Uh, by the way, don't be offended if I refer to you as criminals. You are all criminals. I ask my students this all the time. I have yet to have a single class in which there was a single person who wasn't an habitual criminal. So, I would like to think that most of you are committing somewhat different crimes from them, but maybe not. I don't know. Um, I'm going to point to several culprits in this story, but the real culprits in terms of the misunderstanding are us. Okay. It's not that people are lying to us, it's the way we respond to the information. So, for example, um, we watch the news. And we sometimes forget that the stuff that happens every day, the stuff that's ordinary, the stuff that's usual, isn't the news. So something really extraordinary happens. Something terrible happens. And we respond to it, A, as though it never happened before, and B, as though it's happening all the time. Um, and we panic, and we go to our um, representatives in state government or national government, we say, you got to do something about this threat. And we live in a democracy. So, in fact, they go about doing it. Whether, it's, whether there's really anything they can do, whether there's really a threat out there, whether it's really anything new, um, we see these problems, we conclude that they're common or growing problems rather than unusual events. Maybe that's better. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I see the screen better. It'd be important to see the screen better. If you can see the screen better and me worse, you'll all be happy. <laughs> we watch crime dramas. I watch lots of crime dramas. 
I have news for you. Most crimes, most murders, are not solved in 38 minutes. <laughs> if you're watching an hour show about the rest of it is commercials, you've got about 38 minutes of air time. You and I have lived long enough to remember when actually you got 48 minutes of show, but now it's about 38 minutes. Excuse me? Okay. But real life isn't like that. It just if television showed us, if television dramas showed us the real world of police work and court work, they wouldn't be called television dramas. They'd be called television snoozers. And we wouldn't watch it. Doesn't it amaze you when somebody walks into the office with a binder that's about 800 pages long, flips it open, and says, oh, here it is. I've got it. As though nobody has to read through the whole 800 pages. And as though the first hypothesis they find is always the right one, and they run off and they. Um, unfortunately, life doesn't really work like that. You know, it, it's the job of television to entertain us. The real world isn't all that entertaining, so they show us something different. It's the job of the news media, the news media can't do their job if we don't watch. And if it isn't interesting and dramatic, we don't watch it. It's not their fault. It's our fault. It's not their fault. Oh, gosh. Okay. Um, we draw the wrong inferences from what government agencies tell us, police departments and things. Police respond, police agencies, sheriff's departments, police departments, they respond to our concerns about crime. They have a political task, which shouldn't surprise anybody here who studied organizations. Um, this is a context in which what Lewis said at the beginning is exactly right. It's a business like any other business. Their business is business like any other business. They have to convince us, A, that they're doing their best, so we don't throw them out, and B, that they could do better with more resources. <laughs> if you're surprised by any government agency, the message, whose message can be translated as, we're doing really good, given our limitations, but we could do better with more resources, if that surprises you, you're not paying attention. <laughs> and you haven't been for the last, oh, 100 years. Um, you know? So it, it's not surprising. It's not surprising. If we demand, if, if there's some crime um, that we perceive, and we see it's a serious problem, we say to these folks it's a serious problem, and the police respond to us with, A, actually it's not that serious a problem, and B, nothing we can do about it anyway. We don't take that setting down. It may be true, but we don't take that setting down, and they know that. So that's not how they're going to respond to those kinds of questions or requests. I can give you lots of examples of demands that the public make on the police that if they studied criminology, and typically they don't, but if they studied criminology, they would know are things that are going to be useless, that are not going to help, but they make us feel better. We asked for it, they gave it to us. So my students then, on their, on their exam, say, well, the media are lying to us. No, they're not. The politicians are lying to us. No, they're not. For the most part, they're not telling us anything that they don't believe. They're not. Does the county sheriff or the local police chief believe they could do more with more resources? Of course they do. Of course they do. Um, we shouldn't be stunned by that. Do they think they're trying really hard? Of course they do. When the media tell us, this is a real problem, look at this, how interesting it is. Um, they believe that. I have a brother in the media. I have a brother who works for the Associated Press. <coughs> um, for the most part, I have great admiration for what they do, but most of them have the attention span of a gnat. <laughs> and the historical perspective of a gnat as well. You know, so how often do you know, this is a huge and growing problem. Did they look up the data and see what, how, how long this has been going on, what it was like 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago? Of course they didn't. Very difficult for them to do that. Somebody assigned them a story at 10 and told them to have the story written at 12. 
There's not time for that kind of research most of the time. So we draw the wrong inference. <laughs> so let me start with some general stuff, and if you want, I can give you some more some more specifics. I, um, you know, crime in the streets is something we think about at, like so many other things. It just gets worse because we all know at some level, we all, all believe at some level that the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Um, <laughs> Is crime getting worse over time? And the answer to that is no, it is not. Uh, are there problems with the data? Sure. But all the different sources of data over a long period of time tell us that since the 1960s and 70s, there's been a rather dramatic decrease in crime and violent crime in particular. Okay? Depends which crime you're looking at, depends on the exact time period, but that's the basic thing. There are a lot of different reasons for it. One of them, one of them, as I told my, as I tell my students, is that my generation, the so-called baby boomers, got older. Teenagers, teenagers are not just a pain in the ass, they commit a lot of crime as well. Um, so when instead of committing crime, we bought houses, got married, had mortgages, had children, um, our eyesight got worse, our hearing got worse, we got slower, couldn't run away from the police as fast, and we st stopped committing quite so many crimes. Or at least we stopped committing quite so many crimes of the kind that worry the police. Um, if you like, I actually looked up, I can give you some information. I looked up some information about Syracuse. You can get this for literally any city in the country. I did it for the city, I could do it for the standard metropolitan statistical area, but if you're interested, you get, and again, you, you get slightly different. I can get, you know, five different numbers. <coughs> you'd think we would know, for example, in 2013, how many murders there were in searches. You'd think we'd know that. We actually don't, <laughs> exactly. Um, you can get different, but all the numbers are close. In 2013, Syracuse had 12 murders. Um, 43 forcible rapes, that's a harder number to know. Murders tend to be reported or you trip over the body somewhere. Forcible rapes, again, a good number are not reported. But there's no reason to think that the reporting rate has declined. 164 robberies and 326 aggravated assaults. Uh, aggravated assault is a, an assault that um, can be aggravated to pay, uh, sometimes by the victim. If it's a police officer, fire off, a fireman in some jurisdictions, jurisdiction is a teacher, then it's automatically aggravated assault. Typically, if you use a weapon, it's aggravated assault. It can be depend on your intent. If your intent is to, to cause serious harm, that can make it an aggravated assault. It's an assault that's more serious. Typically, it's a felony, sometimes regular assault is a misdemeanor. There were 326 of those. Um, if I compare that to the farthest I was able to go back in just a few minutes was 1995. Okay? So about 18 years ago. At that time, there were 18 murders instead of the 12 we just had, 84 forcible rapes instead of the 43 that were reported, 633 robberies instead of the 164, and 732 aggravated assaults instead of the 326. Those numbers are not unusual in cities around the country. And if I went back to the 1970s, I'd find even much greater declines, much much greater decline. Places that we, <coughs> I ask my students um, for information. What, what do you think about different cities in the country? What do you think about cities in the state? New York City is always one that comes up for them as particularly dangerous. It's actually particularly safe. The crime rates in New York City are lower than the crime rates in Syracuse <laughs> on a per capita basis. Have been for quite some time. But of course, it's a big place with a lot of people. So, you know, are, is there a murder or two almost every day? Yes. Used to be five. Now it's one or two. But it means in the paper there's always a murder. In the news there's always a murder. It looks like a lot of it is happening. Yeah. Is it too much? Of course, any murder is too much. But it's um, decreased dramatically, dramatically in the past 50 years or so. Why do people have the impression that it is getting worse? Again, 
These are the inferences we draw from our sources of information. Um, it's not that they tell us it's getting worse. It's that, that these new things happen. There are these new threats, or what we perceive as new threats, um, and they sound to us like they're worse than the old ones, or we don't have any way to control them. And you really have to read the news very carefully and to read certain kinds of news sources. Uh, you know, every year or so, the New York Times will have a story that the FBI has come out with their latest crime data, and actually, they're going down again. They're going down again. Um, that might happen once a year, but you can read a, a, you know, a story about robberies and burglaries and murders every day. So those tend to overwhelm the stories about you know, what's the long-term trend here. Uh, you know, we're really interested in these trends, but one of the things they do in the, uh, on the TV news is they interview the victims. You know, if you're the victim, you don't really care about the trends. This is a threat that should never have been allowed to happen to you, to your family, to your friends, to your community. So, in fact, we have what we call crime panics. We get a lot of them. They happen all, all the time, usually based on some horrific incident that is genuinely horrific, that's just horrible. And everybody jumps up and starts running around and trying to figure out what to do. What the criminologists do at that time is they, they look at the last 20 years of data and, and say, is, how, how normal is this? Is this just, you know, an idiosyncratic and unusual event? Because there are always some crazy people out there. Or is it really a growing problem? Makes a difference. Um, I have two rules for my students. One, um, war is a bad analogy. War on crime is a bad idea. War on poverty is probably a bad idea. Are, are crime and poverty serious problems? Yes. War is probably not the right analogy. And the other one is if it's a law that's named after a particular victim, it's probably not well thought out. It's probably a response to a crime panic. Let me give you one particular instance. Um, we talk about danger in the schools because we, we all know that some really horrible things have happened in schools over the last 5, 10, 20, 30 years. We know that. We see it. Um, what, what do we make of all this? I mean, incidents like Columbine and Newtown have people worried about the safety of their children in schools and demanding action. And I understand that. I think we all understand it. Um, the National Rifle Administ um, Administration has suggested that teachers carry guns or that armed guards be posted. I understand that as well. Um, how dangerous are our schools really? Should we be worried about sending our kids to school? Well, you know, we, we want our kids to be as safe as possible. We, of course, we want everybody to be as safe as possible. As of 2013, the data indicate that schools are safer than they've been at any time in the last 20 years. Your children or your grandchildren are less likely to be injured at school than they are at any time in the last 20 years, and probably less likely to be injured there than they are at home. The odds of a US student being killed in a public school are considerably lower than the odds of their being struck by lightning. Now, you know, usually we, we, we warn our kids about what the things they need to do to avoid being struck by lightning, but we tend not to lose a lot of sleep over it. Okay. Does it mean we shouldn't do things to make our kids safer in school? Of course it doesn't mean that. But it, doesn't, but it does mean that schools are not an uncommonly dangerous place. Last year at the college, they made us all go through active shooter training. <laughs> Really active shooter training? And, you know, sometimes I just blow this kind of stuff off. But I, okay, they want me to do it. I'll do it. The, you know, I'll give them an hour of my life that I won't get back. What did it amount to? It amounted to 
you know, the, with, I, I got a little bit of useful information, but mostly it amounted, as I told the students, um, to what I expected. Lock the door, hide in the corner, pray. <laughs> <laughs> there are some places where the response has been to allow students to carry concealed weapons on campus. As a professor who's handing out occasional failing grades, that doesn't make me feel more secure. I'd rather take my chances with the occasional lunatic who comes by than with a room full of armed, grouchy 19-year-olds. I'm just suspecting that's not the solution I want. So, you know, we should do what we can um, we should make the schools as safe as we can, but we should do so with the background notion of schools have not gotten more dangerous. They really haven't. And our children are on a greater risk of, of school, at school than they used to be or than they were other places. Um, we worry a lot about murder. Um, you know, we, 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 we seem to be terribly concerned about that, and I understand why. I mean, you know, as crimes go, it doesn't get, it doesn't get a whole lot worse. Um, but some of my students worry a lot more about murder than they worry about things that are much more likely to harm them or kill them. They're two and a half times as likely to die in a vehicle accident. And let me tell you, one of the ways in which they're crimin criminals is that they drive like morons. They admit in class they drive like morons. Had one of them tell me this year, well, of course we speed. The speed limits are too low. 65 is ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> and I always say the same thing to them. I'm not going to say it exactly to you the way I say it to them, because the way I say it to them is obscene. But basically what I say to them is, that's fine. I understand that. Stay off the road when I'm driving. I'll let you guys know when I'm going to be on the road. You stay off because you're friends. <laughs> there is no such thing as a rolling stop. Just, the evidence shows that you can't really multitask, especially when that means texting while you're driving. Watch how many people just sit out at a corner and watch how many people are talking on their cell phones or texting, which is even worse, while they're driving. Several Canadian provinces made it illegal to text while driving. The accident rate increased. <laughs> One of the themes of my class is you have to watch out for unintended consequences. So instead of people holding their phones up at the top of the steering wheel and texting, now they were holding it in their lap and weren't even pretending to look at the road. <laughs> if the goal is to save more lives, and actually we, we've made a lot of progress with traffic safety. We've made a lot of progress. Um, but if the goal is to save more lives, we might do better by shifting some more resources toward traffic safety and, and less about worrying about murder. Um, <clears throat> they're three times as likely to die by suicide as by homicide. If you want your kids or your grandkids to be safe, worry more about that and think more about that. And, but they don't, you know. We, uh, sure, we, uh, we have concerns about it, et cetera, but we worry more about murder. Murder is actually considerably less likely to affect them. We're almost four times as likely to die in a work-related accident than by homicide. I'll say this in a way that sounds a little harsh. I don't mean it quite this harshly, but yeah. So our employers are four times more likely to kill us than some stranger <laughs> with a gun. Um, and I hope that's not because they know us better. <laughs> Actually, they don't, because homicide is likely to take place among people who know each other as well. The chance that you're going to be killed by a stranger is actually fairly small. It's those you know and love <laughs> that you need to watch out for. <laughs> And that actually makes a nice transition 
to the topic of corporate crime versus street crime. Um, the costs of white collar and corporate crime are many times the cost of street crime. But we don't tend to focus on it much. The media don't focus on it much. We don't focus on it much. Um, it includes a whole range of things, but you know, simply includes environmental crime, consumer crime, and employee safety violations. I used to show my students a, a, um, a movie on employee on safety at work issues. Um, but let me give you a non-lethal example. In 2012, 933 million dollars was recovered in wage theft cases. Employers who didn't pay their employees money they were owed, and a court said so, and said they had to pay it. 933 million dollars, which is three times the total amount of money stolen in all robberies that year. <laughs> three times. And, and, that's a dramatic understatement of the iron wage theft, because most employees just walk away from it. Most just walk away. Most can't afford a lawyer to deal with it. They tend to just walk away. <clears throat> if I talk about this in certain contexts, what I get is a narrative of how we're over-regulating our businesses and strangling job creation. I'm actually not that opposed to strangling job creation by people who don't pay their employees what they're legally obligated to pay, but that's another story. Um, but that's the narrative. Um, we sometimes forget, I mean, we, we talk about safety regulation as though it's some kind of plot hobble business, and we forget that the Occupational Safety and Health Act was signed into law by that notable bleeding heart liberal Richard Nixon. <laughs> Which should tell you something about how the parties have changed over the last 30 or 40 years. OSHA was a Republican law. In cases like this that are prosecuted, they rarely make the news. This is all, this is just a problem with my computer, sorry. A new laptop and haven't quite mastered it yet. They rarely make the use, often because they're settled with confidentiality agreements, they're settled with consent decrees in which the offender often doesn't even have to admit any guilt. Okay. Imagine if you could go knock over the local 7-Eleven, steal a couple hundred bucks, and when the police caught you, what they said is, okay, if you give back the 200 bucks, we won't tell anybody you did it. You don't have to pay a fine. You don't have to go to jail. You know, I suspect there'd be a lot more 7-Elevens getting knocked over. But that's just me. So I want to talk about a couple of different aspects of the criminal justice system. Many of my students come to this program with a desire to be police officers, to be law enforcement officers. And that's fine. We need more law enforcement officers. We need good law enforcement officers. We need law enforcement officers um, who are highly educated, who know how to deal with the public. Um, but most of them don't have a clue what police officers do. Not a clue, you know, because a TV show that pl shows police officers walking or driving around and chatting with people all day long and filling out paperwork would not be a show any of us would watch. <laughs> a TV show that shows police officers directing traffic would not be a show any of us would watch. The, just so you know, the average police officer in the course of their career never takes their gun out of their holster in their entire career, much less shoots it at anybody. And that's true even in the major cities. It's true even in New York City that the average New York City police officer gets through an entire career without ever taking their gun out of their holster um, in action. Do they need to know how to do those? Of course they need to know how to do those things. If they're going to carry guns, it would be nice. Um, but that's not what most police work is. <laughs> 